sisters this is dr umar johnson the prince of pan-africanism i'm coming to you live this morning from raleigh north carolina raleigh north carolina a uh, good morning to everyone good morning to the brothers and sisters here in raleigh north carolina just to let everyone know i will be speaking this afternoon here in raleigh for the first time in almost three years Okay, so the last time I spoke in Raleigh was November 14th of 2015, St. Augustine University. I will be speaking today, this afternoon, in Raleigh at 4 p.m. at the Smith Temple Church. Um, and that is located at 322 Southeast Street, E-A-S-T, 322 Southeast Street. Today, doors open up at 3 o'clock. We'll get started at four. All children free, 17 and under. All elders free, 65 and older. All college students, $10 with ID. Everyone else, you can get your tickets online for $25 and at the door for 30. Everyone else, tickets online for 25 and at the door for 30. Tickets online, drumarjohnson.eventb.com. That's D-R-U-M-A-R Johnson.eventb.com. For the folks who are on the call, I need you to mute your phones. Mute your phones. I hear feedback. I hear conversations. I hear static. This is the first black parent teleconference of the 2018 year, and I need it to go smoothly. Someone has not muted their phone. I can hear your background. Please be respectful of other people and mute your phone. If you can't mute that phone, then you may have to exit the call. Okay, do not put the call on speaker because that will give me feedback. I also have a question I want to ask everyone before I get started. 
I don't know what Facebook did to my public page, Dr. Umar Ifatunde. I don't know what Facebook did to my public page, Dr. Umar Ifatunde. But for some reason, I don't see a go live link. I don't see a go live link on my Facebook public page. I haven't seen it for about a week now. I haven't went live during that whole time. I haven't been live for a couple of months now since before we went to Africa for my fifth annual Africa tour to Ethiopia and Egypt. If anyone knows where the live button is, where they may have moved it to the Facebook public page, please let me know, okay? There's the possibility that Facebook has banned me from going live on my public page. There is the possibility that Facebook has banned me from going live on my public page. But I'm asking you all, if you know where the new live button is, maybe they moved it. I can't find it. I cannot find the live button on my Facebook public page, Dr. Umar Ifatunde. But if anyone knows where it may be, let me know. But I think Facebook has banned me from going live on my public page. And the interesting thing about that is it disappeared. My Facebook live button on my public page, Dr. Umar Ifatunde on Facebook, disappeared the very next day after I posted the flyer for this morning's teleconference. I'm going to repeat that. When I posted this flyer for today's Black Parent teleconference, the very next day, I did not see a live button on my Facebook public page. So I'm thinking Facebook banned me from being able to help black parents by way of uh, the black parent teleconference by way of Facebook, okay? So anyhow, anyhow, if you're on uh, Facebook, if you don't mind, drop a post, brothers and sisters. My Instagram people, you already know I'm banned from YouTube. You already know I'm banned from YouTube. So my Instagram people, if you could put a post on your Facebook page, and for my Facebook people, I'm, I, I'm actually going live from my old Facebook page that I don't even use, Umar Abdullah Johnson. So if you happen to be a friend of mine on Umar Abdullah hyphen Johnson Facebook page, you can see me live on that page. I don't even use that page. I, I don't even use it, but I'm going live from there right now. Most people don't know that. Okay, so for my brothers and sisters out there in Facebook and Instagram, if you can let people know, Dr. Umar cannot go live from his public page or fan page, Dr. Umar Ifatunde. He's going live from his regular Facebook, Umar Abdullah hyphen Johnson, which is going to limit a lot of people because, you know, it's just going to limit a lot of people. But again, if you can get to it, Umar Abdullah hyphen Johnson on Facebook, Umar Abdullah hyphen Johnson on Facebook, you can watch it. But I'm hoping there's some way we can solve the problem of me not being able to go live from Dr. Umar Ifatunde on Facebook. That link disappeared. My live link disappeared the very next morning after I posted the flyer for today's teleconference. So I want to get started because I can't go long today. I have a lecture to get ready for. I also want to get back out to the African American Festival here in Raleigh. For those of you who don't know, the African American Festival in Raleigh is going on yesterday and today, uh, beginning, I believe, at one o'clock all the way to like 11 o'clock. They had some very good old school music bands out there last night a lot of good vendors a lot of good food um so make sure you support that and then i want to see everybody at the smith temple church at 4 p.m this afternoon doors open up at two so this is for the parents this is for the parents and for the parents uh i'm going to get ready to open up the line so if you know of any parent that needs help with their child if you know of any parent that needs help with their child, wake them up, call them up, tell them you can't be oversleeping. Or you may have to go late to church tonight because Dr. Umar is conducting a black parent teleconference for the first time of the 2018 year. All right. The number 857-232-0158, 857-232-0158. And the access code is 870-864-POUND, 870-864-POUND. All right, so I'm going to go to the line. Uh, do we have a question about our children? This call is only about the children. Uh, if we have a question, if somebody can 
go ahead and start with the first question by beginning with where, you, where you're calling from. Do we have a question? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Sounds like you're on speaker. You got to take me off speaker because I'm getting too much feedback. Hello? No speaker. Yeah. Yeah, I got this. It's on my, it's on my Google account on my computer. Okay. It's not good for the call. I'll go ahead and take your question, good brother, but it's not good for the call because of the feedback. It sounds like a loudspeaker, but go right ahead with the question. We'll, we'll deal with it. Yeah, I have a question. I, I just got custody of my son about a year ago from his mother. Yes. And um, uh, when I got him, I, had just, I found out that she had put him in special ed in the, in the first grade. Yes. And uh, so last year when he went to school, you know, I was working with him and, you know, the teachers, I guess, and... Well, his grades weren't that good, and at the end of the year when I got his last report card, most of his grades were failing, but they passed him to go to uh, fourth grade. Now, I spoke with his special ed teacher, and I told her that I don't think it would be right to promote my son to fourth grade because, you know, he hasn't mastered third yet, and fourth grade would just be more difficult for him. And she did agree, but she said, well, you know, he has an EIT, you know, and this and that. I said, well, yeah, I said, but he's not, he's not ready for court. So this year when I registered him for school, um, I told them that, you know, he's going to third grade, but they went ahead and registered him for fourth grade anyway. So I went up to the school, uh, matter of fact, Friday to speak with the principal. The principal wasn't there. But I spoke with one of the administrators, and they said, because he failed first grade, first of all. He's only 10, and he failed first grade. And the lady said, well, he failed once, so we're not going to hold him back. And I told her, I said, well, look, I'm not putting him in fourth grade. I said, well, you know, he'll never catch up if y'all keep promoting him. You know, so I just wanted to see what I could do to, you know, if, is it a good idea to hold him back? Should I let him go to fourth, or should I keep him back? Okay. First of all, I heard you say that uh, your son's mother put him in special education in the first grade. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Okay. That was a mistake. That was an absolute mistake. We have to stop allowing our young children to be evaluated for special education. Whenever I'm a school psychologist, certified school psychologist, whenever I get a referral for an evaluation of a kid in the fourth grade or under, fourth grade or under, especially third grade or under, I'm gonna look at that with a great deal of suspicion. And the reason I'm gonna look at that with a great deal of suspicion is because when we're evaluating for learning disabilities, when we're evaluating for intellectual deficiencies, when we're evaluating for autism, when we're evaluating for emotional disturbance, it is hard, it is very hard to confirm and verify those types of disabilities in very young children. Getting your son tested in the first grade for a learning disability is absolutely ridiculous because you can't prove a learning disability and you damn sure can't prove it in a six-year-old. So that was a mistake. That should have never happened. Whatever the problem was, I'm quite sure that it was rectifiable in the regular ed setting without a need for special ed. So with that being said, let's fast forward to the third grade. Okay, there's a lot of background. Black man, can you mute your phone while you hear this answer? Are you able to mute your phone while you, while you mute your Google while you hear my answer? Okay, go ahead and mute that because I'm hearing a lot of background. And everyone else on the call, you should not be on speaker and you should be muted. Please follow the protocol. You should not be on speaker. No speaker phones and everyone's phone should be muted, please. So everyone can hear me clearly. Now, let's fast forward to third grade. You said that he was struggling and that you wanted to have him held back instead of going on to the fourth grade. Well, first of all, if that's what you feel, you need to stick to your guns. I don't have a problem with a child being held back if that's in their best interest. I don't have a problem with the child being held back 
if that is in their best interest. So if that's what you feel, you tell the IEP team that, individual education program, you tell the IEP team that, and you stick to your guns, and, you, and, and he will be held back. But here's the bigger question. Here's the bigger question. The bigger question is why is he struggling as a special ed student? A special ed student by federal law has a right to a free and appropriate public education. If your son is still struggling as a third grader, then his education is not appropriate. He's been in special ed for first grade. He's been in special ed for second grade. And now he's in special ed for third. You want to hold him back for the fourth, but he's already been in special ed for three years and he's struggling. That's a big problem for me. That tells me that the IEP team, the school and the district are failing your son. Now, the IEP team has three responsibilities. They create the learning program for your son in special ed. They also determine the placement where your son is going to receive his special ed service. And then number three, they are responsible for tracking your son's progress to make sure special education is benefiting your son. That's the job of the IEP team. If he's struggling, then that tells me right there the program might not be appropriate. If he's struggling, that tells me right there the placement may not be appropriate. And if he's struggling, that also tells me right there that he's not making the progress that federal law guarantees you he should be making. So that means you need to call an IEP team meeting. You write a letter to the principal. Always deal with the principal. The principal is the only legal responsible party in that school. Not the special ed teacher, not the special ed liaison, not the counselor, not the school psychologist. It is the principal. And I'm a former school principal myself. So write a letter to the principal and tell him you want an IEP meeting to discuss your son's progress. Because your big question is real simple. If he's in special ed and you guys are obligated to make sure my son makes progress, why is he not making the progress? Now, with that being said, there's a couple of things I want you to consider. One thing I want you to consider is requesting of the principal that your son be given an independent educational evaluation. One thing I want you to know, my brother, is that every parent in America who has a child in special ed if they can substantiate their requests, has a right to an independent educational evaluation. This means, this means that you pick a school psychologist of your own that you find and they evaluate your son and then they determine whether or not they agree with the so-called learning disability that they say your son had since the first grade. So consider asking for an IEE. Okay. In addition to that, consider asking for compensatory education. What do I mean by compensatory education? When a child receives special ed service, if the service is not appropriate, remember, the federal law says your son has a right to a free and appropriate public education. Now, if that education is not appropriate, because remember, the school gets money for your child to be in special ed. The state sends your child's school money to provide that special ed. So if they're getting money and your son's not benefiting, that means your son is entitled to compensatory ed. That means they have to pay you money for the time he was not being properly serviced. They have to pay you for money for the time that he was not being properly serviced. Now understand, you don't get this money in a check. It don't come to you directly. It goes into a fund and you build the school district for supplemental services to help get your son where he should be given the fact that they did not properly educate him. The other thing you might wanna consider is having them put him in a different school in the district, a school that you feel would do a much better job educating your son. And the fourth thing I think you should consider is the fact that 
the school could be forced to pay for your son to go to an approved private school, APS. Federal law says that if the school district cannot meet the child's needs, if your child's school cannot meet his needs, they have to pay for him to go to an approved private school. So those are some things that you need to think about. But the biggest glaring issue here, two of them, number one, your son's mother should have never got him tested as a first grader. Black parents, stop getting your kids tested as first graders. That's number one. And number two, the biggest issue here is your son is in special ed and he's still struggling. He's in special ed and he's still struggling. That's the other issue here. Do you have a follow-up question before I go to the next parent? Uh, yes. I was just, well, when I went to the school, so should I let him, because school is starting uh, Wednesday. And I told them, I said, well, he may miss the first day until I straighten this out with the principal because they are insisting on putting him in fourth grade. Right. Well, here's the thing. You don't, you do straighten it out with the principal. You do. But you straighten it out with the principal within the context, within the context of the IEP meeting. Okay, who's the IEP okay. team? The IEP team is the principal or someone the principal appoints to act in his or her place. But you're going to demand that it be the principal. You're not going to allow the principal to put someone else in that meeting. In your letter requesting an IEP meeting to discuss your son's progress, you're going to specifically state, I am requesting, I am demanding that the principal be present. If the principal is not there, we cannot hold the meeting. That needs to be in your letter. So you're going to say the principal must be there. So the principal is required, okay? The regular ed teacher that teaches your son, if he gets any regular education, because he probably has a split program, he might be a part-time kid, pull-out kid, the major regular ed teacher that teaches your son should be in that meeting. The special ed teacher that delivers the IEP. The special ed teacher that delivers the IEP should also be in that meeting. And you as the parent, you are the four required people. Regular ed teacher that teaches the kid. Special ed teacher that teaches the kid. Principal or designee, but you're going to demand the principal and yourself and anyone as necessary. So anybody else you think needs to be there on the school team, needs to be there as well. And that's where you straighten it out. And this is what's going to happen. If they refuse to hold your son back, you're going to tell them you're not going to sign the IEP. Don't sign it. Don't sign it. And then you're going to get in contact with the state department of education and you're going to file a due process complaint against your son's school district with the state. You're going to fill out a due process complaint. And that means the state is going to send a hearing officer to the school district to hear your complaint. And they're going to hear the school's defense. The hearing officer acts like a judge. They're not a judge, but they're given the power to decide special ed cases because there's not enough judges in America to hear all the special ed cases going on in this country. Okay? So if they don't, do what you ask. Tell them you're not signing the IEP. Okay? And then you're going to get online or pick up the phone Call the State Department of Education, Bureau of Special Ed. Let them know you want to file a due process complaint against your school district because they are failing to provide your child with FAPE. You want to use the word FAPE in your due process complaint to the state. FAPE stands for Free and Appropriate Public Education, and you might want to write that down. My son is being denied his federal right to FAPE. That's the acronym for free and appropriate public education. I am demanding an independent educational evaluation to see if my son really even has a disability, to see how much progress he made since they put him in special ed in the first grade. I'm demanding three years of compensatory education for the fact that they failed him these entire years, three years he's been in special ed. And I'm also demanding an approved private school. I don't even want this school district teaching my son anymore. Now I'm giving you the strongest things you can come at them with, okay? You might just want to give them a chance to fix this because you do have to have a track record. You do have to have a track record of success before the state will consider the private school, okay? You don't have to have a track record to get the independent eval. They'll give you that. They may even, and they'll give you the comp ed even. 
but for the approved private school, because that could be the most expensive thing in your package of requests, you need to have a track record that you've tried to give the school an opportunity to fix this. And you're just now coming in. You're just now coming in. Now, how long have you had custody of your son? I've had him a little over a year now. Okay, you had him a little over a year now. This is what I want you to do, black man. I'm going to give you my personal cell number. Write it down right now so I can move on to the next parent. After you have that meeting, you're going to get in contact with me. After you have that meeting, you're going to get in contact with me and let me know what's going on. Now, there's two ways you can do that. One, you can call back into the Sunday morning call, which is what we're doing today. And for all my parents out there, the new call is Sunday. We used to do it on Tuesdays. I'm doing it. I'm going to try Sundays now. So you call back here and we can deal with your issue this way. But of course, I don't have a lot of time on this platform because I try to get to as many parents as possible for free. But then also you could schedule a private consultation with me as well. A private one-on-one -on -one to look at your paperwork, let me know what's going on, and plan our next strategy of attack. So my personal cell for you and everyone else out there, if you need to text me, I don't answer calls, but you can text me and then I can call you. And that's 215-989-9858. 215-989-9858. 215-989-9858. All right, write that letter, hold your meeting, make your demands, don't sign anything unless you agree. Complaint to the state if they don't hold him back. You might do a complaint with the state even if they do, to be honest with you, brother, but let's talk again after your meeting. Okay. All, All right. right. Thank you, brother. Appreciate no problem. No problem. You, Indeed. Black African power. Do we have another question out there today? Yes, good morning, Dr. Good, good morning, morning, black man. Where you calling from? I'm calling from Albany, Georgia. Me Albany, and my wife on the line. Albany, Georgia. Yes, sir. Go right ahead with your question. All right, so uh, well, my name is King Randall. I had um, maybe missed you probably once or twice um, last week. And I was calling because uh, me and my wife, we were just now a year, now we're having a year anniversary, um, probably about a week, a few weeks ago. And uh, we just got pregnant, uh, maybe back in May, and we actually just want to, you know, ask this question, like, how, where do we start, you know, when do we teach the child about racism? Um, you know, just a few um, pointers that you can give us, you know, for having our first child, um, if you can. Well, number one, with the child, you know, it doesn't begin after they're born. It begins while they're still in utero. So you want to start reading to the child now. You want to start meditating with the child now, praying with the child now, build your relationship with the child in utero. There's more than enough research that says the child is fully conscious that they have two parents and that they can communicate with those parents even during gestation. So you want to start now. As far as teaching racism, you know, my view on that is you teach racism once you know the child has experienced it. Once the child comes home and say, Daddy, the teacher don't like me because I'm black or black people are ugly or the white kids get treated better than me, or somebody caught me the N-word. Once your child has experienced racism, which means they know what it is because they told you, and they will tell you, when you talk to them, they will tell you, okay? That's when you sit them down and you start, and you give them that introductory talk about racism. You give them the Ice People, Sun People story, and I'm working on the Ice People, Sun People book now. So you'll be able to read that book to the child as part of your introductory conversation on racism. Okay, but uh, once they know. Now, what does the, the science, so-called science, the literature says that at four years old, the literature says that at four years old, so-called research, okay, but I agree with this based on my 20 years of experience as an educator and a school psychologist. At four years old, a child knows their race. They know what race is. And they know the degree of respect that their particular race gets. That's pretty deep. They know what race is. They know what racism is. And they know the level of respect that their race gets at four. Okay. Children are very brilliant. Okay. So anyhow, that's when you teach them black men. Okay, all right. I appreciate it. I don't have any follow-up questions. No Thank problem. You. I should be coming to Albany, Georgia soon too, black man. I'm working on that. So you might see me um, in your city before the year is out. All right. So feel free to uh, yeah. check in on me. Send me a text or a tweet or something every once in a while. You know, you can also text my number 215-989-9858. And um, 
you know, from time to time and just see uh, where I am with that. I do post all my dates on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, uh, but uh, Albany is definitely in the works. Thanks for the call, black man. No problem, and I'll be there. Will do. Peace and love. Is there another call on the line this morning? Another question. Is there another question on the line this morning? Yeah, good morning. Yes, sir, black man. Nothing Where you? On? Yes, sir. Three black men in a row. I'm proud of my brothers. We got it's normally dominated by women, but we had three black men call in a row today. Shout out to the black fathers out there doing their thing. Where are you calling from, black man? I'm calling from Patterson, New Jersey, brother. Ah, right, brother Bilal, what's going on, man? I just picked up the voice. I'm feeling um, uh, very, very uh, good, man. Uh, that the uh, conference call was back on, and particularly on a Sunday, you know what I mean? This is like, uh, this is church for me. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. And, uh, Appreciate uh, it. Uh, uh, so to speak, in terms of um, uh, replenishing yourself and regenerating um, the spirit and the mind, um, um, uh, what I have to say is similar to what one of the other brothers um, just mentioned, and I think I really need to have a private um, a conference uh, with you. Son had just come um, into my custody, my youngest son, 15 years old. He uh, had a conversation with his mother and told her that um, that the man that was in her life now um, should not be imposed on him because he has a father, he knows his father, and he wants to be with his father now throughout his, uh, his high school years. So, um, since that time, my son has been with me like about two weeks right now. It does something for my spirit. It does something, um, you know, for, um, uh, you know, for his spirit. And you still there, Bilal? Yeah, I'm here. Okay. Forgive me for a minute. No problem. Because it's, it's very emotional because my son it's something that um, he needed uh, more so than anything. And, you know, a lot of times uh, when you uh, uh, grow apart, fall out of love, whatever uh, uh, narrative people like to uh, uh, spin it on with uh, a woman that's given birth uh, to your children, they are doing very spiteful uh, things. But I've found out through, through, throughout the years that when these things actually happen, it backfires and the children um, eventually come back to you. So I've witnessed this here with my um, my son. Now, one of the things I found out, you know, my son was telling me that while he was in school and, you know, they're living in a, a city next to Patterson, which is Lily White, where um, he was called nigger. Yeah, mm. yeah. The Lil Hakeem's son called the nigger and the mother never uh, 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 communicate uh, any of this uh, uh, to me, but this is weighing heavy on my son's uh, mind. Also, my son tells me that in that same environment, you know, the um, uh, a uh, community hall, him and another friend, uh, another black kid inside the place, and they single them out and try to accuse them of um, following um, some, some young white girl. So my son tells me that, um, you know, we asked them, um, you know, what well, well, show was on the camera since you said it's on the camera, that we were just having a, a conversation. And, you know, he really didn't have any backup there because he tells me that she didn't want me to get involved because I would turn it thing upside down, which I'm going to turn it upside down anyway. Right. You know, we're going to follow up. So my thing, uh, my question to you, what advice um, uh, would you give me uh, right now? Because I tell you, I'm really... Okay, let me go ahead and jump in. I really enjoy it. I really, I really enjoy it. Got you, got you. Well, number one, your problem is a common one, okay? Or the dilemma, because we'll work through it. It's a common one. A lot of mothers, right. okay, because mothers tend to be a primary custodial parent. A lot of mothers when they don't 
like the father or want them involved or whatever the case may be. They think that they can substitute the biological parent for a surrogate. In other words, this is the man I'm going to spend my life with. This is my husband. This is my significant other. And so I'm going to swap out his dad for my new mate. And what I always try to get mothers to understand, and sometimes fathers too, because sometimes the fathers are the custodial parents. Children want a relationship with their own biological parent. They don't want a surrogate. Now, they might get along with the step-parent. They might love the step-parent. They might even see them as a second dad, but they're not the primary. You're not my biological. And so many moms have a difficult time understanding that you cannot give me a surrogate. You can't give me an artificial replacement when I have a real one who I know loves me and wants to be with me. And I get calls from mothers all the time who say, Dr. Umar, you know, and of course, this is not you, Brother Bilal, because I know you personally. Right. But they'll say things like, right. you know, his father's no good. He's a drug dealer. or He's a drunk or he ain't got no job or he's a womanizer or he's this or he's this or he's this. What does that have to do with your son wanting a relationship with his father? Even if you feel the father is putting the son in harm's way, there's still a such thing as supervised visitation. OK, so even if the father is guilty of abusing you, which is no small matter that we can't take lightly, there's still a such thing as supervised visitation. So there's really no excuse under the sun for why a, a mother would keep the father away, although they do it. OK, and then on top of that, try to force the child to adopt another man as their dad when the biological one is there. And I try to get people to understand. I don't care how much better you think. The biological parent is, excuse me, the, the, the surrogate, the step parent is. He might be a lawyer, a doctor, a millionaire. He might shower your kid with gifts. He may genuinely love your son, but he is not the person responsible for that child being in this world. And everybody wants to know their biological parents. I know people 60 and 70 years old still looking for their biological parents. There's nothing like knowing who you are and where you come from. It's no different than the United States of America telling black folks, you need not worry about your African roots. You are American now. That We don't settle for that because we know our history is older than America. America is less than 300 years old, so you can't give me your Americanism and tell me to forget about my Pan-Africanism. I'm not going to do that. So one thing we might consider doing is you and I, if she's open, having a phone call with the mom to just discuss the situation and possibly even with the stepdad if he is, you know, really going to be the man in her life. You know, maybe that's a conversation the three or four of us uh, need to have. You still there, Bilal? Okay. We might have yeah, lost. Still here. Yeah, still so. Here. That's something I'm that, still yeah. That's, I'm, saying, I'm saying that I, I definitely agree. I'll be reaching out uh, to both of them to, so that we can set something up like that because my son is adamant um, um, about it. Uh, no court or anything has been involved with this matter at all of, of, of right now because I didn't uh, take it um, uh, to that level. But if I have to, which uh, I wish I, I did not have to, I will have to take um, um, that step because I'm not going to subject my son an environment where, my, where he, uh, uh, he feels the hatred for himself. Yeah. Got gotcha. you. No problem, Brother Bilal. And I'm going to rap to you, too. I'll hit you back uh, uh, tomorrow on my ride back to Philadelphia about the school situation. We'll rap soon. Yeah, in fact, um, you know, um, I, did, I told my son this here uh, that I believe that we might be getting close to uh, seeing this here uh, independent um, uh, Percy Dudman and Martin Garvey School, and he's just excited about it. You know, he, he, he's listening to you at 15, Doc. Powerful. Powerful. Yeah. Appreciate and, and that. He, he enjoyed the one. The one that he went to was um, the uh, the, uh, the clip you did on uh, LeBron James School, and he loved it. So I appreciate you, brother. I love you, man. Got you, brother. No problem. Uh, All right. Take care. Uh, before we go to the All next. Right. Thank you. Before we go to the next call, somebody said that biological parents are overrated. I couldn't disagree with you more. I couldn't disagree with you more. 
Speaking as someone who's been a therapist for 20 years, a doctor of clinical psychology, a certified school psychologist, as well as a former school principal, I totally disagree with the statement that biological parents are overrated. I would actually say the opposite. I would say step parents are often overrated to the exclusion of the biological parent. Let me go to the next call. Is there another parent with a call on today? Yes, hello. Peace and love, black sister. Where are you calling from? I'm calling from DC. Yes, ma'am. Go right ahead. And and I thought this was the perfect time for me to jump in with my question because it's kind of on that same topic um, regarding parenting. Um, yes. I have. I am struggling with co-parenting um, with my son's biological dad. Um, I'm an advocate for fathers being in their child's life. Um, however, in my case. <clears throat> Um, the relationship my son's father and I had was very toxic and abusive. Um, and so it's kind of carrying over into our, co our ability to co-parent. Um, and all I want is um, a healthy co-parenting relationship and a relationship with um, a healthy relationship um, between my son and his father. But the challenge is um, what I'm getting is that my um, son's father would rather just be a big brother, if that makes sense. Okay, what they is he? A, I'm sorry, what is he not doing? They have a, they have a great bond. Um, they have a great bond, they have a great relationship. Um, however, when it comes to the parental responsibilities, um, that's where I feel my son's father is lacking. He'd rather just be um, involved on standby so to speak, meaning that he may want to just hang out with our son, and that's it. Okay. Um, and of course, my son, of course, my son appreciates that, you know, the ability to go hang out and be with his dad. But when it comes to, you know, taking care of um, financial responsibilities, holding our son accountable when he gets in trouble at school, none of that. Um, and so, therefore, it's just kind of out there the grunt and the burden of taking care of the parental responsibilities, where my son's father can just kind of step in and have fun dropping back off for me to take care of the rest. Okay, question. How often does the son spend time with the father? How often on average? <laughs> well, um, because of a lot of the challenges we've been having, um, it's been extremely inconsistent. Um, and meaning that to the point where I had, there was a point where I had to cut off um, that, that relationship. Um, Why? Um, I had full I had full custody. Why? There was a um, his dad has done things out of spite, um, meaning that when we arranged, I think this was some point last year, we had arranged to pick up and drop off, um, drop off. Um, his, he was supposed to drop our son back off to me around three o'clock. He didn't do so until after nine o'clock p.m. Didn't um, respond to my calls of, of his whereabouts between those six hours, um, and he did it out of spite, um, just to intentionally upset me. Um, he, and also then a, a time after that, our son was with him for two weeks and our son came back with a, a live tick on him. He refused to, um, help with the treatment of that. Things like that is what caused me to then ultimately cut off the relationship. Um, because I thought that just wasn't, it wasn't healthy. Um, he wasn't being responsible. Okay. Um, but then, it, and, and that's very conflicting for let me. Let me jump in. Let me jump in, Queen. Let, let, let me jump in only for the sake of time. What is he not doing that you need him to do? What is he not doing, the biological father? What would you like him to do? Uh, there's no, there's no, zero financial support. Okay. Um, and also, our son has gotten into trouble several times. I get a lot of phone calls from school, and when I mention that to his dad, there's no backup on that. There's no support. How no. old is the son? Seven old. Our son is coming. Now He's now 11. Okay, number one, yeah. just one thing, okay? If the father does not spend a lot of time with the son, whether it's because you cut it off or, you know, you limit him to the weekend or whatever the case may be, he has to be very careful that he doesn't destroy his relationship with his son by being the disciplinarian who doesn't live at home. So, for example, sometimes moms want the dads to be the disciplinarian, but they don't let them be dad enough first. 
So if a mother doesn't let a father be a father first, he can't be a disciplinarian either. So sometimes they want the they want the father to be the disciplinarian before he's the dad. So you set up a situation where the father's like, wait a minute, I don't get to see my son. I don't get to make decisions in his life. I'm not a factor in his life. But when he messes up, you want me to step in and take control. But you you've never given me a father's role in his life. So how can I then come and be the disciplinary? I'm not saying that's you at all, black woman. I want to be clear. I'm not saying that's you. But a lot of black women make the mistake of marginalizing the biological father as an irrelevant entity. And then when the son gets in trouble, they want the father to step into his full role in responsibility, something that they've kept from him for all of those years. So, you know, he may be playing it safe with his son. So I guess the first thing that has to be done is you have to evaluate the role you've given him, and he has to evaluate the responsibility he wants for his son's life, and then we can talk discipline. But I would absolutely hate for your, for his father to be the disciplinarian before he's had a chance to show him how much he loves him, because if he disciplines more than he loves or builds a relationship, then the son will reject him. The son will reject him. So the non-custodial parent walks a tightrope. I'll give you another situation. Incarcerated fathers. I used to do a lot of work with incarcerated fathers, and I plan to do it again. It's just that they've been trying to keep me out of the prisons so much because of my so-called you know, controversial stances on things. But nonetheless, when a father is in jail, mothers tell the father, your son got in trouble, he got into a fight. You need to get on him. And there's nothing wrong with the father speaking with the son about his behavior in school when he goes to visit his dad in jail. But guess what? The jail visit is not for purposes of discipline. The jail visit is for purposes of emotional bonding, emotional support, son-dad relations. It's not a time to be the police officer. Okay? And if and I tell moms, if you keep trying to make the incarcerated father and in your case, you know, the non-custodial father, if you're trying to make him the police officer or the disciplinarian above and beyond being the loving dad, then the whole situation will break down. And I just don't want a, a, a situation where the son doesn't feel close to the dad and possibly doesn't feel close to you when things start to go on in his life. So we got to get dad more involved first before we can give him more of the disciplinary responsibility. We have to get dad more involved in the son's life first before we ask him to step in to be more of the disciplinarian. Received. You follow me on that? Yes. Yeah. All right. And if we ever need to have a conversation with me, you and the, and the father, you know, as a consultation, we can do that too. We can do that too. So just, just keep me posted whether it got to be face to face. I, I'm, I'm, in, I'm in DC kind of regularly, the Baltimore DC area, if we need to do a face to face, but we could do it by phone as well if you feel it it, it, it it needs to come to that. Thank you. Thank you, love. Good luck with that. Is there another question on the call this morning? Somebody asked for the number to the Black Parent Teleconference. The number is 857-232-0158. Eight five seven two three two zero one five eight. I'm gonna type it in Instagram. Eight five seven two three two zero one five eight. And the access code is eight seven zero eight six four pound. Okay. My people on Facebook, same thing. Eight five seven two three two zero one five eight. Don't call my cell phone. Call the conference line. Don't call my cell phone. Call the conference line, 857-232-0158, and the access code is 870-864-POUND. Is there another question this morning on the call? Good morning, Dr. Umar. It's uh, Mr. Randall again from Albany. I was just going to ask another question because I was trying to wait for somebody else to ask. It's all right. I guess I'll ask another one. Go right ahead. All right, so... um, my dad, uh, he has more kids, you know, a little baby mom, of course. And um, I was actually talking about my uh, my little brother and little sister. He has two kids from one woman, and um, they're about 12 and about 10 years old. 
And so whenever I uh, um, go visit them and stuff, you know, I try to keep a close relationship with them. And uh, when I go and visit them and talk about my dad, they have, like, this, this anger towards my, my dad, like, their biological dad. Like, she doesn't have a stepdad looking for them. She's single. But um, anytime I try to talk about him or anything, they, you know, they start, you know, snarling and, you know, saying this adult stuff that I, I only know she's teaching them. And so when I come over there, I call my dad and to let them talk to him over the phone and stuff like that. And, you know, they start acting all, you know, crazy and stuff. And so last year when I left for Marine boot camp, um, my dad came to my going away party and so did they. And they were like all over him at the, uh, at the party. They were all over him. And so when I brought that up um, to them around their mom, they were like, oh, no, he wasn't. We, didn't. we don't like him like that, you know, da, da, da. And so I wanna, I'm trying to figure out what can I do. I try to tell her, you know, without saying it, like, can you please, like, stop, you know, bad talking him, you know, to those kids. Like, even though he's not the best dad, you know, he still try to talk on the phone or something like that. I don't have a problem with that because my mom, I always try to make sure, regardless of if he didn't do anything for me, we had a great relationship. And so I even remember, like, the small thing. My dad only came to two football games my, my whole life, and I remember him vividly because he was there. And um, I just want to know, like, what can I say to her or to, to them? Or I even thought about having, you know, the kids, like, I taking them with me to go see my dad to just have a sit down with them and ask them how they feel and stuff like that. Because the things that they say about them are only adult things. They are not even old enough to understand what they're even saying. And I know it's her, and she'll say it's not her saying that, but yes, it is. I know it is. So what can I do or what can I say to her? What can I do with the kids and my dad or what? Okay, so just so I'm clear, you're saying that the mother of your father's other children, whenever you talk about them having a relationship and spending time with him, she dismisses it and speaks negatively about him? Am I correct? Yes, and she also does that to the kids to the point where the kids are like, I don't want to see him, but even though the last time I brought them to see him, right. they were like you know, excited. Well, that is a very big problem in the black community. Uh, most mothers, not me, not, let me not say most, many mothers, many of our sisters, many of our beautiful black women, they have this belief that since they are the one that give birth to the child, the child actually, quote unquote, belongs to them. Many black women have a very Eurocentric approach to parenthood. It is very Eurocentric. They don't see it as a shared responsibility at all. They see it as I'm in charge, I carried the baby, I birthed the baby, the baby is mine. You may have supplied the semen, but that's it, the baby is mine, and I will tell you what role you're gonna have in your child's life. A lot of black women have a very controlling, narcissistic and psychopathological approach to parenthood where they see themselves as the owner of the child. And when they see themselves as the owner of the child, it makes it very easy for them to keep the child away from the father because they see the child as a part of themselves. This is me. So if I don't want you involved with me, I will keep you from my child. They don't see the child as a separate human being evolving into an adult, you know, that two parents must be a part of. They don't see that. They see that this child is me. This is my property, like my car, my pocketbook, you know, my clothes, my house, the baby mine too. And I will make the decisions about this child. And I might, I might consult you uh, when, 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 when the time is right. And that's why I think black men, you know, really have to be careful when we make children with a lot of women who've been raised by damaged women. Because that's what I see a lot of times in these situations um, you know, many of the women who have this mindset, they come from mothers who also had a very health, unhealthy approach to mothering where they felt that they owned the child, you know, and I see it intergenerationally as well, where the grandmom kept the grandfather away from his kids. The mom keep the father away from their kids. The granddaughter keeps the father away from her children. And it just goes on and on and on. And no woman is going to tell you up front that, you know, if this relationship doesn't work, I'm not going to let you see your children. They don't tell you that. And unfortunately, sometimes keeping you away from your child is the only way that they feel they can get back at you. If it's the only straw that they can play, they're going to play it. If it's the only straw that they can play, they're going to play it. So we just got to be careful. And sometimes women go through it too. 
Sometimes women go through it too because we have more fathers now that are custodial parents too. So, you know, it's a very tough situation. It's a very tough situation. All you can do is try to introduce another thought into the mind of the children. But I don't want you to go so far with the mom that she cuts you out the kid's life too. So you got to watch that. You know, some mothers are of the persuasion where if you don't agree with my keep away game, if you don't agree with my hide and seek strategies with the father, then I'll cut you off the kid's life too. And we need you there because you have to at least be able to tell them that your father wants to be a part of your life and it's the mother that's keeping them away. So, you know, make sure you don't go too far to get excluded yourself because that won't help the kids at all. They need somebody there who can tell them the truth. Okay, because um, another thing with her is she tries to, like, subconsciously make me their dad. Um, she'll call me, you know, I'm their big brother, I'm 19 years old. And she'll call me when, you know, their grades start dropping, or she'll call me if they need, like, maybe some milk at home or something like that. She'll like, hey, can you bring, you know, them some milk or something like that? Or she'll call me for all the stuff that she could call my dad for. And it's not that I'm trying to become their dad or anything. It's like my little brother is like, he's not, he doesn't see me as his big brother. He has like a, some type of, I don't know how to explain it, but he sees me like almost as his dad. Like that's, I don't want that relationship. I want to be that big brother. And, you know, I still try to come around all the time and, you know, come see him and stuff like that, you know, talk to him about his grades and all that stuff. And when I did come talk to him about his grades, all of his grades changed. He started gaining weight. And I told him, I'm like, you need to start losing that weight. He lost all that weight, and, like, he listens to me. He has, a, a you know, a huge respect for me, and he looks up to me. But I see him looking at me like his dad, and I do not like that. And I still try to, you know, call my dad and let him talk to him and stuff like that. But um, I just don't want to be seen as their dad. Like, she tried to make me, you know, look, like, towards them, and that's not what I want. I want to be their big brother, which I am. I got you. Well, let me ask you this question. Is the father willing to be there? Does the father want to be involved? He wants to be involved, involved, but um, just like the sister said earlier, it's like a like he can't. He's not. He doesn't. He can't do anything for himself. He doesn't have a job. Or he doesn't have his license. But he can't. You know, just go see them now. If I bring them to him, yeah, he can see them. He wants to see them. No doubt, he'll call me and be like, "Hey, can you bring them?" Okay, here? and she and she won't let you do that, correct? But she she I can, but I don't want to without her permission. Right. No, I'm asking. Will she let you? Will she approve that? Is what I'm asking. I don't think she would say no, but she she would be like, if they want to, you know, something like that. Even well, then take them. If she say if they want to, it doesn't sound like she's blocking, then take them. For the sake of your younger siblings, brother, take them. If she's not blocking, take them. They need that. Okay. They need that. Yes, I would take them. Fathers okay. matter. Mothers matter. Both parents matter. We, you know, it's not about one or the other. You know, it's, it kind of reminds me of this whole black woman is God movement. Yeah, the black woman is God, but the black man is God too. The black child is God. The black elder is God. Black people are God. Why are we trying to give one gender more of the responsibility or more of the blame than the other? We're all gods, you know, You know, the man and the woman. You know, why we keep separating this whole gender thing? You know, that's a very Eurocentric thing. Our culture based on balance and respect for both the masculine and the feminine principle, and neither principle is more important than the other. The feminine principle isn't more important than the masculine, and the masculine isn't more important than the feminine. We need them both, so I'm all about balance. I'm not for this whole thing, the father's more to blame, the mother's more to blame, the mother's more important, the father's more important, the black woman is God, the black man is God. How about we're all important and we're all gods and goddesses? How's that? So yes, brother, go ahead and take your chill, go ahead and take your siblings to go uh, go see the dad uh, and, and, and just keep me posted on how that goes. And I'm going to go ahead and take the next question. Appreciate that question, brother. Is there another call this morning? Another question on the call this morning. Excuse me. Hello? Yes, ma'am. Where are you calling from, sister? Baltimore, Maryland. Baltimore, Maryland. Go right ahead with your question. Yes, yeah, so I am having a dilemma of making a decision. Um, I was previously married to a man and I had a child. I was pregnant, five months pregnant when me and him got back together. Um, his family was a big support in my life throughout my pregnancy. We got married three months into our marriage. 